Have you ever wondered why some people who aren't a native of a nation called expats and others are called immigrants? We're going to look into why this is so and how these terms are related to events in the past and also the image they project upon the people they refer to. You know, I have been living outside of my passport nation for quite some time now. And the terms that are or were used to describe my status in my host nation and others has caused me to think about the reasons I've been welcomed or perceived differently in these nations. Also, while talking to other people about their overseas life, I've come across terms used to describe or define them to be tied directly to the job or service they performed in their host country. And I wanted to find out how they felt about the terms used to describe them. So I looked into the possible reasons why. However, while doing so, I quickly discovered that there were facts that had to be honestly laid out in the open to, for all to see. Even though some facts conflicted directly with some of their perceptions or beliefs as to why they have a certain status in their host nation, I continue to pursue conversations with them to search for and uncover the underlying reasons why this is so. And as I continued, I found that my search took me way back to colonial times, when European nations were spreading their influence all over the world in pursuit of overseas empires and riches. Now, as their overseas confiscation of land and material wealth increased, so did their image as conquerors of faraway lands and their people. And as a result of their aggressive tactics, the new European overlords became the supreme leaders over their newly acquired lands, peoples, and materials. Now, today the words supreme and supremacy have taken on a damaging connotation in the minds of people all over the world because it relates directly to politics, wealth, and even race. Modern day supremacy has asserted the meaning that certain people or groups have the right to possess powers or privileges simply because of their economic status, political affiliation, religion, or race. The word supremacy, as well as the word privilege, as they relate to foreign nationals overseas, have become lexicons that carry a lot of baggage with them that needs to be carefully unpacked and investigated. Now, the truth is, these terms assign an unbalanced status to those who are addressed by them, and in some places, this usually implies that the foreigner in question is of a special breed of human. It appears that those foreign nationals who are classified in different ways are entitled to be given or denied privileges or treatment because of his or her perceived uniqueness or lack of. Now, it's an undeniable fact that foreign nationals from certain preferred nations are given carte blanche in many situations. Now, I'm broadly using the term preferred nations to describe countries that are seen as financially, technologically, militarily advanced or powerful. Now, countries that are smaller or less financially or military powerful may look to these more powerful nations as protectors or models to base themselves on. And honestly, it's not unusual for more powerful and influential nations to attract this kind of attention from smaller, weaker nations and um, even the people of these nations. But let's take a moment, just a little moment, to look into the terms that are the root, the root words used to describe foreign nationals. They are emigrant, which refers to anyone departing from one country to settle in another country, and the word migrant, which generally refers to someone who has moved from one country to another with the sole purpose to find work, just a job. Now, a term that is commonly used to describe foreigners who are living short-term legally abroad in a nation is called expatriate or expat for short. Now, one simple Generic definition used to describe an expat refers to any person, regardless of skin color, religion, politics, whatever, who is residing temporarily outside his or her passport nation. Okay, sounds cool. Simple to the point. 
However, keep in mind that the word expat originally referred to a person who was expelled from his or her home country, generally kicked out. Now, there's that other word that is related, and it's called immigrant, which refers to someone who is permanently legally legally living long-term in a nation he or she isn't a native of. Many foreign nationals who are classified as being immigrants may not have plans to ever return to their home or passport nation. Here in Taiwan, most people would classify me as an expat, but in reality, I may not really be one. So once again, the simple distinction is that an expat is just someone who resides temporarily, legally, outside his or her passport nation. So an expat, at some point, some point in time, plans to return to his or her passport nation, and an immigrant is someone who plans to permanently, legally live in a nation he or she isn't a native of. But is that, is that really the way most foreigners are really described in some nations? So, at this point, there are a few related words that we can focus on. But for the purpose of this discussion, let's focus on the words expatriate, that's expat, and immigrant. Because they are the two that states or describe foreign nationals the most in their host country. Now, the point is, how are foreign nationals really defined or classified in a host country? And what are the criteria that are, should be or are used to define the status of foreign nationals? Now, as an overseas foreign national who happens to also be a person of color, when I travel to different nations, I find myself falling in and out of the range or borderlines of prefer preferential treatment. That's the word. This is because the terms expat and immigrant don't collectively apply to all foreigners from all nations all of the time. When we look into a crowd and see people who aren't passport holders of the nation they reside in, should we address them all as expats, immigrants, or collectively something else? Let us look at how these words carry different connotations. But before we do so, let's take a moment to look at this from a historical angle. How about a broad historical angle? Because it becomes very apparent how cultural supremacy plays a role in how foreign nationals from certain preferred nations are address addressed and treated. Europeans use their military might to set their sights on forcefully and selectively colonizing the world. They purposely disregarded the livelihoods of the original inhabitants of the lands they were hoping to acquire materials from. The Europeans used a mixture of hard and soft invasion tactics to gain footholds in the lands and, for, and materials they were hoping to control. Hard invasion tactics relied heavily on military weaponry, and soft invasion tactics relied on making the people of the conquered land economically and spiritually reliant on them. Soft invasion tactics use formatted social controls and educational techniques to build reliances that were indirectly used to weaken the social fibers that held the original inhabitants together. The next point can be hard for some people who are members of certain faiths or religions to hear. Along with the tactics mentioned earlier, Religious doctrines were used to accelerate submission to the colonizers' collective cause for the minds and hearts of the indigenous populations. It is easy to see how religious doctrine formatted in European nations were used to forcefully denote local belief systems of many African and Asian nations. However, on the other hand, it cannot be denied that many indigenous populations benefit to some degree from the advanced health care and technical skills brought to them from the European nations. In a relatively short time, the indigenous population interpreted the powers of their European colonizers as being the principal means of uplifting themselves. Most of the original people of these nations made a conscious decision to adapt to their colonizers' lifestyles laws, and religion to not only lessen their own personal burdens, but also to create opportunities and improve the lives of their children and, in turn, 
future generations. As European financial institutions expanded their influence in colonized nations, the indigenous populations began to view their colonizers as symbols of wealth and technological advancements. And very quickly, and mainly as a result of social programming, people from European nations gained privileges over the indigenous populations they conquered. This quickly developed into outright arrogance. Europeans' perceptions of being superior and privileged later turned into openly displayed hatred of the people who weren't like them, as observed in a number of genocides that took place in not only colonized nations, but even in Europe itself. Over time, nations that were once colonized by Europeans began to fight back and later gain their independence, but continued their relationships with their former colonizers, partly because European financial institutions maintained a foothold in their former colonies. The mindset of being superior was still maintained in the minds of many Europeans and even in the subconscious minds of the people of their former colonies. This brings me back to the point that the words or terms used to describe foreign nationals really does have underlining connotations. The undeniable fact is that the term expat in most nations has been reserved for white people, mostly from Western nations or preferred nations, because the term immigrant is reserved for people mostly of darker complexion who may be originally from less advanced or influential nations. Foreign nationals who are casually classified as immigrants in some nations are placed in a lower social ladder and aren't offered or have been given limited access to many local services that are readily available to foreign nationals who are classified as expats. Simple as that. And as a result, a sense of cultural superiority presents itself as a measuring stick to be used to classify and describe people from certain nations. It is obvious that these interpretations are laced with classism and racism. Classifying foreign nationals based on their ethnicity or cultural background just passes on the baton of racism. And if we are to build a better cross-cultural understandings, this must be avoided wherever and whenever possible. And because I've observed that most foreign nationals I've come across who prefer to themselves as expats don't have the drive or maybe the need to objectively understand the culture they are living in. This could be because some foreign nationals have developed opinions about their host country that makes it appear that their host country isn't up to their personal standards or the standards of their home nation. The way some foreign nationals from preferred nations speak about their home culture sounds very much like cultural narcissism. Another reason may be the fact that many foreign nationals I know, especially from so-called preferred nations, are consistently moving around to other nations because their job or business, which may cause them to feel like they don't have a reason to learn much about the nation they are temporarily living in in because they will have to move and keep moving on to other nations. So what is the end result of all this observation? I think that anyone who has decided to live overseas for any reasons must take the time to consciously understand their overseas status without adhering to thoughts that they are superior, privileged, or inferior in any way. I also think that national governments should pay more attention to how they describe and classify foreign nationals because the way they interpret foreign nationals' status has a direct influence in how their local population views, welcomes, and interacts with foreign nationals. Understanding the origins of the words used to describe a person's overseas status along with the perception it may give is very important. Many foreign nationals are lucky in some ways, but surely not superior or inferior. And my question for you today is, if you are a foreign national living abroad, have you found that your status in your host nation preceded you or predefined you? Have you found that your status in your host nation has given you any privileges, perks, or negative experiences? 
Please leave a comment below if you have anything you would like to say or share concerning this topic. And if you have found what we have to say of any value, please click on the subscribe and bell buttons to help us spread the word that we have a lot more in common than we think. We're very interested to hear what you have to say. For Four Seas One Family, I'm James Thomas in Taipei, Taiwan. And remember, take care wherever you are.